Hello, everyone. We're just going to give it a couple more minutes to let uh, more people join, and then we will begin. Okay, we're going to get started and let people join as they uh, come through. Hi, everyone. My name is Julia Wong, and I am the Marketing Director for Wild Women Expeditions. Thank you for joining us for our Antarctica webinar this evening, afternoon. Um, and just a reminder that this, uh, this webinar will be recorded, so we will post it live to our YouTube page afterwards. Um, so if uh, you want to rewatch this at your leisure, you're more than welcome to. A couple, other couple of housekeeping things. If you have questions as we go along, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box and we will either answer them as we go or at the end of the webinar when we do have a Q&A session. And any questions that we don't get to, we will respond to you back via email um, as soon as we can so that we can get your questions answered. So we at Wild Women, um, our purpose is to empower women to live happier, healthier lives by connecting with wild nature and each other in an outdoor adventure travel. So expedition travel is no exception. So tonight we are talking about the seventh continent, Antarctica. Tonight's panelists I'd like to introduce to you are, Franny, if you could switch that slide. Franny Bergschneider, our global program and operations manager. Julianne Davies, our adventure specialist. And Kara Matthews, with reach, our regional sales manager at Quark Expeditions. Welcome everyone. Um, and I'll pass it over to Franny to begin. Thanks, Julia. Hello everyone, I'm Franny Bergschneider. And um, as Julia mentioned, I work for Wild Women Expeditions as the program manager. Um, and I also have a huge background in the polar regions. I worked um, actually with Quark Expeditions for eight years. Um, in the Arctic and Antarctica and um, had the privilege of going on over 80 expeditions to Antarctica. Um, and I wanted, we wanted to talk to you a little bit today about um, how we choose our partners and why we choose our partners. Um, really, they are experts in their field. They have a huge, um, a huge expertise in the, in the areas that they're exploring. We look for, for folks that are environmentally and socially responsible um, with a huge um, lens on sustainability. And of course, we, we prefer to uh, partner with uh, companies that are community oriented and that have a huge, uh, that are, have exceptional female guides. Um, and so we're so happy and lucky to be partnered with Quark for these Antarctic expeditions. Um, we love working with them so much. They really have the ethos that uh, the people make the place. And uh, it's so wonderful to travel to a place with people like that. Um, because then the place becomes just this huge bonus. And what a bonus Antarctica is. Um, they're also they have also have a huge emphasis on sustainability, um, environmentalism, and education. And with that, I'll pass it over to Kara to talk a little bit more about Cork. Great, thank you so much, Franny. It is so wonderful to be with all of you virtually, and it is an incredible honor to be partnered with Wild Women Expeditions and with Franny talking about ethos and mentioning, especially Cork with sustainability, is such a big piece of what Cork Expeditions does. So my name is Kara Matthew, and I've actually been with Cork Expeditions for almost 15 years now. I did my first trip with Cork back in 2010. And then what I'll talk about a little bit about later is I did my first trip to Antarctica uh, with my aunt, who was in her late 60s at the time. And so this truly is for so many different ages and great for mother-daughter trips and uh, aunt and uh, niece trips as well. But if you haven't heard of Cork Expeditions, that's okay. Uh, we have been in the business for almost 32 years though, and we only do polar travel exclusively. 
So when a partner like Wild Women Expeditions comes to us to be able to partner, it is a great privilege to be able to lead and help uh, alongside the group share these most beautiful places on the planet with. So I'm delighted that Wild Women Expeditions has chosen Cork Expeditions for multiple Antarctic voyages this upcoming season and the next. So the next slide, please, Franny. As I mentioned, Cork Expeditions has been in business for almost 32 years. It'll be our 32nd anniversary in December, this December. We were actually the first company to take passengers to the North Pole back in 1991. And we're actually the first company to fully circumnavigate Antarctica, the fifth largest continent with travelers as well. And so when you're traveling with Cork Expeditions, you're in really good hands. We are specialists in these regions. We don't dabble a little bit in the polar regions. This is all that we do. We go to the Arctic and Antarctica. We don't travel anywhere else in the world. It's really what separates us from a lot of the, the operators that are in Antarctica. Another huge differentiator and one of the reasons why I've been with Cork Expeditions for so long is our expedition team. Honestly, they help me even strive personally each and every day to find passion in all that I do. Our expedition team are top notch. They truly are the best in the industry. We have one expedition team member to five guests. That's a really low ratio. And that really means a more personalized experience and more hands-on approach in these areas. And as you'll hear from Franny later on, we have experts in their fields. We have glaciologists, biologists, we have historians. I used to think polar history was so a little dry, actually, I have to say that. But when I started traveling with Cork Expeditions and our historians brought the stories to life of the explorers that came before is just an incredible, incredible experience. And we even have penguinologists that come with us to Antarctica. I didn't know that a penguinologist even as existed. So it was an incredible educational experience throughout our trip. And it's actually our guides that are driving the Zodiacs, shuttling everyone onto landings, and also sitting with guests. So they'll be sitting with you during dinners and lunches, what really enhances the experience of traveling to Antarctica. Thanks, Kara. Um, yeah, so, and we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about why travel with Wild Women Expeditions. Um, and there's a plethora of reasons. Um, one is you get to be a part of this amazing community. And um, if you're a solo traveler, or even if you are coming with another woman, you you have you're a part of this community this group of traveling women that are together that um have a space on the ship together um which is amazing and as a introvert i don't know if there's any fellow introverts out there i think there may be but it's such a wonderful way to travel on a ship because you get to join the group and then during the day, there's different activities that you'll you'll go out and do, such as hikes or Zodiac cruises, and even being out on deck, everyone will have sort of a different experience, but then we'll all come together at meals and uh, for our special debriefs and gatherings and really kind of um, chat and reflect on what's been special for us. So it's a way to connect and a way to really um, debrief the experience to make it even more meaningful. Um, another piece is that you'll, you'll get a wild woman host. So there's someone who is the mother goose of the, of the, um, gosling, so to speak. And, uh, she'll be guiding you and giving you, giving you extra instructions, or if you need help with anything, she's your go-to gal. Um, um, yeah, and it's kind of like your personal concierge while you're on the ship. Um, and they'll welcome you in Ushuaia until you disembark again in Ushuaia. Um, and there's, we have some exclusive Wild Women expedition, Expeditions programming. Um, some of it will be bespoke as, as uh, we're on an expedition and things come up. Um, but we, we really, um, 
we really try to carve out time and space while we're on the vessel to meet, take photos, have little gatherings and debriefs, um, have a have a toast for us. And um, we, of course, we always meet at every at every meal. And it's a it's a nice way to have experiences and then come together. Here's a photo of one of the receptions that we had on board. The toast. And here's a photo of a Zodiac cruise. So um, some of those exclusive um, programming opportunities would be uh, women only Zodiac cruises here whenever possible. And this Zodiac cruise is in South Georgia. So you can see a little bit of a different landscape in the sub-Antarctic islands, whereas this Zodiac cruise is in Antarctica. And they focus on different things such as wildlife, landscape, and this one is around large icebergs. We'll also go out together on landings. Um, so you can see this group of women at a penguin colony in Antarctica. And uh, here is a picture of our um, Wild Women exclusive tables. So you'll always have a space to eat. Um, and what I love about eating together is that you can really meet each other. And then over the course of the voyage, you really get to know each other and you're not having the same um, surface conversation or the same intro conversation over and over. You really get to know know the people that you're traveling with. You get into the, the gritty details and um, you really get to share, you know, your, your heart with, with your fellow travelers and these women. So it's so nice to have this space and this opportunity. And of course, to debrief your day. Um, one thing that we, we, I've never been on it. I shouldn't say it that I, I, um, one thing that we always try to do while we're on the ship is the polar plunge. And, uh, I'm going to sign it over to Julianne to talk a little bit more about the polar plunge here. <laughs> can you hear me good yep. yeah thanks for any um sorry i have a cold so i'm gonna <clears throat> try to keep my um voice from sounding too scratchy but um here's a shot from the trip that i went on in february the journey to the circle um and this is the group of women i was with and as you can see those are pretty genuine smiles everybody was having a great time and this is prior to jumping in so, um, yeah, it was pretty funny, you know, the lead up to the polar plunge, everybody's like, are you going to do it? Are you going to do it? Well, I'll do it if you do it. And I'm only doing it if you do it. And uh, it turns out everybody jumped in. And I, it's kind of ironic that I'm the one talking about this because I was the <laughs> only one that didn't. And my ex I hate cold water. My excuse was that I wanted to take photos of the women. And I'm really glad that I did because um, you know, every single day of the trip was an absolute blast. It was incredible how much we were seeing the wildlife, the camaraderie, the time that we were spending together, the whales that you could see from the deck. But this day in particular really stands out in my mind. And I know that it stands out in a lot of the women's minds as just a really, really phenomenal day. And I don't know if you can peg that down to maybe the endorphins that get released when you jump in Antarctic waters. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it was pretty, pretty wild. So you're, you, it's super safe. You get a, um, it's totally controlled. Um, everybody comes down, you're in a lineup, they've got music cranked. So it's a little bit of a party as you're leading out to the edge. And then they put a, um, a big waistband, like a rubber with a rubber attachment. So there's absolutely no way you're going to jump in and not resurface. So you, you march down one at a time or pair up with a buddy or, um, if you want to, and you jump in, you're only in there for, you know, a few seconds, really. And then you come out, but um, the amount of laughter and energized, just the crazy energy afterwards was unbelievable. As you can see from this photo, we all, everybody jumped in, they came up, they've got this pool on the deck, which is just an incredible bonus. Um, but yeah, the women jumped in after and they were laughing and it lasted for hours. And then that night we came out, um, came out of the pool, got changed, came back, 
had a, um, we had kind of moored in a bit of a, in a bay so that we weren't moving when the plunge was happening and we had a barbecue out on the deck. And so right after everybody had just jumped into this water, we're looking over the deck and there was um, orcas on one side of the boat. There were whale other, I can't actually remember what kind of, we had three different kinds of whales are surrounding the boat and a seal chase going on all at once in the same water these women had just jumped in and everybody was just on such a high. It was incredible. And uh, even though I didn't jump in, I had a wonderful time documenting it all. So yeah, it's something to, I mean, I, I don't have, everyone was gonna saying that I was going to regret not jumping in and I, I don't, but uh, it was a really neat experience to witness. And I know that all of the women were happy that they did it and pretty special thing to be able to do. So yeah, I recommend it, but that's kind of- You took amazing cool. photos. So I'm glad you didn't jump because those are, you captured the emotion. That's amazing. And you have just as much fun watching everyone. It's oh. so entertaining from watching from the comfort of the vessel. It was one of my favorite days, just witnessing the energy and seeing just these women. There were tears. Women were so overcome by emotion and- and so energized that, yeah, they were shedding happy tears, not cold, not I'm freezing cold tears, but happy tears. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, Julianne. Yeah. And we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the ship because um, she's super special. Her name is the Ocean Adventurer. And um, I've had the ple pleasure and privilege of probably spending about a year of my life living on this ship, not not over, not at one time, but um, cumulatively, cumulatively, cumulatively over uh, the course of eight years, about a year of my life. So maybe even more actually. Um, yeah, but she's a really special vessel. Um, she is, she is, she does, she, you can't fit more than about 130 passengers on board. And so what that allows is it, it gives us the opportunity to, um, just disembark and embark the vessel at a quicker pace, which allows us more time in the places that we love outside in the zodiacs or on the land. It also allows the the captain and the expedition leader a little bit more leeway in kind of like creating more of a bespoke trip. So if opportunities present themselves that uh, we want to take advantage of, we're more likely to be able to because the ship is is smaller with fewer passengers. And the ship itself is like a home. So you will have your own cabin on board. However, you don't really spend very much time in the cabin. The ship is designed to be a home. So there's the dining room and the, the um, lecture room, and there's little, little places around the ship for you to explore and spend your time. Um, there's a library and a clipper bar and, and the outer decks, the outer decks on this ship are just, um, amazing. It's super easy to get from the inside to the outside. It's very seamless. And then there are large spaces to just really enjoy the landscape. Um, so that's, that's my perspective of her, but I'm going to pass it over to Kara as well to talk a little bit more. I think you're on mute, Kara. Thanks, Franny. She is a special little ship indeed. Um, that is well said. And I love how much time you've spent on the ocean adventure to get to know her intimately. I traveled on her for the first time back in 2019. And I felt the exact same way. I love to be able to be in the cabin or in the lounge. But one of my favorite moments on the ocean adventure, um, some of the best viewing and scenery of wildlife and viewing is happening right on the vessel itself. And so even if lunches and dinners, there might be an interruption. As Franny was saying, it is truly an expedition. Um, there are expecting the unexpected moments where you can on the ocean adventure literally get interrupted at lunch if the pod of orca whales is there or a site to see like a humpback breaching. And chef keeps everything hot and expedition team members encourage everyone to gently come out on deck. And to Franny's point, it is so easy and accessible to get right out on deck from any point of this little expedition ship. She only has 128 passengers. And that really means that everyone can get off the ship at the same time. As soon as people are choosing larger ships that are over 200 passengers, 
in the Antarctic region, not everyone can get off the same time. So the Ocean Adventure, to Franny's point, you not only can get everyone off very quickly, but everyone actually, if they want to get off on board for the excursions, they can. So the whole point of being on these little ships is to be able to get off of them. And so we're aiming for a minimum of two excursions a day. So we typically have breakfast on board, phenomenal cuisine, and then we'll go out for an excursion, come back on board for lunch, and go out hopefully for another excursion uh, when it, weather, of course, uh, permitting and wildlife. And the next slide, please, Franny, thank you. So we have lots of different cabin categories on the ocean adventure. So please just reach out to Wild Women Expeditions, depending on the cabin category that you're looking for uh, when you're traveling with them. Everything from owner suites and suites to great little twin porthole cabins. They're adorable. And I love that for any mention, it really is your home away from home where you're not spending too much time in your cabin. Maybe even journaling, I would grab my book and take it to the lounge in case if I'd see a friendly face and chat. So the twin portholes are a great cabin category with lots of uh, lots of room and your luggage goes right underneath your, your bed there. But then we also have the window cabins, the twin window. If you do feel like you want a little bit more extra viewing area out of your window, um, that is a great option as well, the twin window. So those are our popular cabin categories. Of course, we have superior cabins, deluxes, all the way up to the owner suites as well. But one of my favorite places to be on the ocean adventure is the bridge. Uh, we have open bridge policies on all of our vessels. And I really encourage you when you do decide to book with Wild Women Expeditions and travel with them is to get out not only on deck as much as possible, but also visit the bridge. As Franny mentioned, our expedition leader will be there as well, generally speaking, uh, working with our captain and looking at ice charts and seeing, planning on where to go next. And our expedition team are actually in the bridge and looking for wildlife and really unique experiences 24 hours a day. It's very, very unique. People take shifts on board and they have a little, a little chart saying when they, when they go and people sign up for it for the expedition team. So there will always be familiar faces on the bridge uh, if you do go up there at odd hours um, of the wee morning or late at night. And the dining is incredible. Just because we're on an expedition doesn't mean we're sacrificing our cuisine and our creature comforts with food. The food is absolutely fantastic. And as Franny mentioned, Wild Women Expeditions can mingle together uh, different sizes tables and it's one seating for each meal. But if you're not traditionally a breakfast person and want to get up early for breakfast, we do have an excellent pastry chef on board the Ocean Adventure. So if you are a really early riser and you want to get your cup of coffee or your cup of tea in with some pastries early before anyone else, our lounge is available as well. So as I mentioned, the whole point about being on these little expedition ships is to get off. And we really need these little ships, these little home bases in the regions because the modes of transportation there are limited. Uh, really, the ship is the best way to maneuver in these really remote uh, areas of the planet. So, so much is actually included when you are booking with Wild Women Expeditions on a trip to Antarctica. Various levels of hiking from contemplative walks to longer charging groups, depending on the level of hiker that you are or even that you, what you feel like that day. And also it is weather dependent. And so getting off the ship is included, uh, as well as the Zodiac cruising is included and Zodiac landings. I love maneuvering around iceberg alleys and seeing wildlife from the safety of the little Zodiacs as well, these little rubber boats. I've been asked quite recently how, what a Zodiac is and what it looks like. So I did wanna share with you on the bottom right-hand corner, that is indeed what a, what a Zodiac looks like. I feel like it's really like the safari jeep out at sea. It really mimics a safari, an African safari seeing wildlife, but in a little boat instead of safari jeep with wheels. We also have photography programs included on all of our trips. So whatever Wild Women Expedition trip you choose to go to Antarctica with Pork Expeditions has a designated photographer, always accessible to you to ask questions or even jump in the Zodiac with. So that is included. And the Polar Plunge is included, just in case if you were wondering if it was an additional <laughs> option or not. So lots is included, but we do have additional paid adventure options. If you decide 
to have a little bit more added activity level to your expedition. So Franny, maybe you can touch upon the levels of sea kayaking versus paddling. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Kara. Um, so you can see on the left hand side, that is the paddling program, as well as the photo on the bottom right. That's the paddling program. And what that is, is it's a super um, accessible one time paddling option. Um, it's a set fee. I think it's about 295 US dollars. And it's you, you can sign up before you get on the ship. Um, or you can, if there's space on board, you could have the opportunity to do it then as well, if there's space. And um, weather dependent, they will send out about 10 people to go kayaking for a one-time experience. Um, and then the, the alternate sea kayaking program, which you can see at the top right there, um, they're, they're closed covered kayaks with the neoprene um, cockpit covers there. Uh, that is that is a part of the sea kayaking program, and that's when if you register for that program, you're you're in the kayaking program for the whole voyage. You go out whenever there is an uh, a kayaking expedition, and when there is a kayaking expedition, you'll go out kayaking, whereas the rest of the ship will go out maybe on a landing or a zodiac cruise, and uh, so you you won't have. Um, like you'll have to choose kayaking or the um, the like the planned excursion. But I will say that when you do go see kayaking, often you will have the opportunity at the end of, of your excursion to have a quick stop on land. So you won't you won't have to necessarily give up a landing. Um, and of course, if you do decide to join the sea kayaking program, then the guides on board will have all that inform information for you so you can make really informed decisions um, before the excursions. In addition, just because you join the sea kayaking program, if one day you really decide you wanna spend more time on land, you can opt out of that of the sea kayaking program that day. Um, so it really depends what you want and how much you wanna be sea kayaking, but um, we have two of the two paddling and sea kayaking options for you to choose from. And we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the itineraries that we have um, that we have on offer right now. And this one is um, very near and dear to my heart. It's um, the Falkland Islands, South Georgia and Antarctica Explorers and Kings. Um, this one is running this year, 2023, from November 14th to December 3rd. Um, and it's such a great trip. It's one of my favorites. Uh, and I just wanted to show you some photos of wildlife that uh, you might be seeing if you choose to go on this expedition. Uh, and so the Falkland Islands, you might be thinking, where in the world is that? I've never heard of that. But the Falkland Islands have the most amazing colonies of black-browed albatross, and you can actually get quite close to them. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have ever been close to an albatross colony or perhaps close to a seabird colony. If you've been uh, perhaps to the Galapagos Islands, uh, you might have been somewhere. But when you're near a seabird colony, it's like a spiritual experience. It's such an amazing energy. It's like you're in the belly of a beehive here. Um, there's birds coming and going and birds sitting on eggs and um they're speaking to each other and preening each other. And it's just, it's just an energy that is really exceptional. And I've never felt anything quite like it before. Um, so it's a super special, peaceful, energized place that just makes you feel alive. You can really um dial into dial into nature and um just how it makes you feel alive and everything that the earth has to offer. So a truly exceptional experience in the Falkland Islands. Um, and then of course, we'll go to South Georgia where there it's the, it's the largest biomass of wildlife anywhere in the world, larger even than the Galapagos Islands. It's just extraordinary. Um, if you choose to travel on this um, epic um, itinerary that goes to the Falklands Islands, South Georgia and Antarctica, in November, 
the beginning of December, you will be hitting the, the wiener season. So we call these guys the wieners and that's because they're elephant seal pups and, uh, their mums have them at the beginning of the season, really early at the begin end of October, beginning of November, and then the mums leave um, because they have to go and replenish their energy stores. And so the beaches in South Georgia in November are just littered with these wieners. They're just everywhere. And you can see that they have these huge, gorgeous eyes and they're just the cutest of all time. Um, and they're super curious. This I took this. I think you can see actually my foot there. Not we're not supposed to be that close, but of course the wildlife don't read the rules we write. So if they kind of approach you, then um, it's fair game, I guess. So this guy just got super close, was super curious, and just gorgeous creature to view in in its natural habitat. Super special. And then we also have the the quintessential highlight, the king penguin. Um, and this is only to be seen, well, you can see a few of them in the Falkland Islands, but really, really uh, a super special animal to be seeing in South Georgia. Uh, you can see this one up close, they have that brilliant yellow crest. And um, if we go to the next photo here, it's not the greatest photo, but I love it because you can just see the scale. So you can imagine how many hundreds of thousands of king penguins are here? You can see the striations in the um, in the in the birds. So you can see there's some brown lines and then some white and black dots. And those brown lines are the 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 chicks, the the um, king penguin chicks. Um, yeah, we always joke that you can see you can see the striations of the chicks from space. <laughs> They're just it's just a huge colony. I think the largest colony. In South Georgia is at um, St. Andrews Bay and there's about 600,000 pairs of nesting or maybe not pairs that's individuals it's like 200,000 pairs of breeding penguins and if you you always count uh, penguins in pairs and so you can do the math that's at least 400,000 with chicks um, it's just a super special a super special sight to be around that many that many um, birds all at one time And of course, my favorite, the kelp. So we are in the subantarctic islands here. It's a little bit of a different, well, not a little, it's a very different uh, landscape topography. You're gonna get the ocean vegetation here. Um, and something that I love to educate people on is kelp. And uh, because it's, six, it's um, about 60% of the air we breathe comes from the ocean. And so it's really cool to see kelp in its natural environment and learn about the different kinds of kelp. You can see on the left there, that's uh, giant kelp. And on the right, it's a species called Antarctica dravilia. Uh, so really fun to talk about kelp when you're in and learn about kelp when you're in South Georgia. And here's the map. So if anybody who was wondering where is the Falkland Islands and where is South Georgia? I, I um, you can see here on this map, and of course you can Google them when you do your own research, but um, the Falkland Islands and uh, South Georgia are part of the subantarctic islands. Um, and then last but not least, you'll go to the Antarctic Peninsula. And I'll, um, I'll spend a little bit of time on the next itinerary talking about the Antarctic Peninsula and what it has to offer. And I love, Franny, that you mentioned South Georgia with the seeming with, teeming with wildlife and the fact that it really is the Galapagos of the Southern Ocean. It's, it's the Serengeti of uh, the Antarctic region. It's just an amazing area not to be missed. And a lot of people go to Antarctica. And I'm so grateful that, Franny, you're, you're sharing people with people of South Georgia and Falklands because a lot of people go to Antarctica and then they need to come back because then they hear so much about South Georgia. Uh, and the Falkland Islands. So this is certainly a way to do it all in one trip. Thanks, Kara. And we also have this trip that we're, um, we're offering as well in 2024. So it's also available for November 4th to November 23rd, 23 um, in 2024. And um, the Antarctic Explorer is, is on offer for December 2nd to 12th. And um, I'll talk a little bit about Antarctica 
and some of the highlights there and and that those those highlights of course would would pertain to the previous itinerary that we talked about so um you'll go to the Falkland Island, South Georgia, and then of course finish in, in Antarctica. And we'll talk about the Antarctica piece just here. Um, so one thing that's just gorgeous, especially at the beginning of the season is the landscape. So you have that full glaciated landscape, really luscious snow. You can just see that, that pristine, pristine, um, it's just a pristine landscape. It's just, it's just beautiful. We call it the moonscape. Um, it's just, stunning and one thing that's great about being on this ship is really you have 360 degrees views wherever you look of just this most gorgeous views you've ever seen in your life and it's just wild the, the scale of this place you can't this picture doesn't do it justice it's even hard to understand the scale of the place when you're there because your your brain like shrinks it down to something that makes sense but um really it's just huge mountains and huge glaciers it's just it's just amazing. Um, another thing that you'll see on in Antarctica are the species of brush-tailed penguins. So um, there on the right are the Gen 2 penguins, and there on the left is uh, an Adeli parent feeding an Adeli chick just there. And then there's also, of course, the chinstrap penguins. Um, and there's some more penguins on ice. I always love, we always love seeing penguins on ice. Um, even though you've seen, well, if you've seen a hundred penguins on ice, it's just the most exciting thing every single time you see a penguin on ice. It's just the, it's just the beautiful, beautiful image and so special and such a Antarctic scene here. Everything is muted and a little bit gray, but just so deep and lush. Just amazing. And we also have Antarctic seals. So this is one of the Antarctic species of Antarctic seal. It's called the Weddell seal. Um, and you'll see these guys sometimes on land and sometimes on the Zodiac cruise. If you're out on deck, you might see them on pans of ice as well. And here's a leopard seal. So the iconic leopard seal. I don't know if anybody has um, seen Paul Nicklin's video of the leopard seal, but if you haven't, you gotta, you gotta Google him after this webinar and just check out Paul Nicklin. A leopard seal footage they're just amazing huge ginormous seals um and you can see them in antarctica and so this is the map of this trip so you'll go from ushuaia down to the antarctic peninsula and then back up to ushuaia i'm looking at that uh, map too for any um with people seeing the fact that you're going from Ushuaia all the way down to that little tip, the finger of land, uh, the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, the Drake Passage does separate uh, South America from Antarctica here. And it typically is about a day and a half of sailing to get to Antarctica. But it's so amazing, the anticipation of going there and so much to see and do on deck, getting out and looking for wildlife that it is an incredibly adventure in and of itself, um, sailing the Drake Passage. Even if you've never been in a ship before in your life, this is definitely an, a, a wonderful experience uh, to have going to Antarctica and having that memory of that badge of honor crossing the Drake Passage. Totally. And another thing about the, the Drake Passage crossing is um, there's an exceptional uh, educational program running on those on that day and a half at sea so it's a beautiful combination of getting out on deck seeing what you can see and then also learning about the environment that you're about to set foot in um and there'll be other lectures as well as you go and uh you'll learn about um some of the things that you're seeing at the daily recap but a beautiful a beautiful portion of the trip is that it's 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 mirrored with educational components to um that are that are woven in as you move your way through the arc of this voyage. And um, this is an itinerary. This is um, an itinerary that we're running in February of 2024, uh, from February 5th to 20th. It's it's um, South Georgia and Antarctic Peninsula only. So this one doesn't go to the Falkland Islands. So if you, this is a really great itinerary if. You know, you only have the time in the new year, for example, 
or if you have less time, but you also wanted to go to South Georgia and see that special place. Um, here's another great photo of all those king penguins, just hundreds of thousands of king penguins, um, just gorgeous. And a special this trip runs at a special time of year. So in this trip in February in South Georgia, you're not going to get the wieners, but you'll get these gorgeous fur seal pups. And you can see they're just, if you start to zoom in on them in this photo, you can just see like 20, 30, 40 fur seal pups here. Um, and they're just, they're just everywhere. It's an explosion of fur seal. They make the landscape really come alive, super vocal. They're super playful with each other, very mobile. Um, and so that's something really special about South Georgia in February. Another thing that we're seeing in February is it's it's a uh, in February is the the krill the krill explosion so it's the algae bloom and because of, because the algae is at the bottom of the trophic level we're really seeing all the krill just exponentially do super well around that time because krill are feeding on algae and so February is just a hot spot for whales the whales come down to feed on the krill and the krill are just exploding in February. Of course, there is a cascade effect. So February is the hottest month, but there will be um, lingering effects into March, of course, and as well reversed into January. But February is just that, like everywhere, as Julianne was mentioning on her voyage, everywhere you look, you're, you can see a whale. Um, and that's because they're down there to feed on uh, that krill. So just a super amazing experience to be right beside a whale um yeah and the great thing about it is that there's so there's often so many whales that you can just have a really quiet um almost like one-on-one -on -one experience with a whale this is all the other zodiacs can go and find other wildlife And so this is the map here for that voyage you can see it goes from Ushuaia right across to South Georgia so a little bit of a a little bit of a crossing there. I think it'll be a three day crossing. But as we mentioned, there will be that onboard educational programming. Um, there's always a glaciologist and a geologist, as well as a penguinologist, or excuse me, an ornithologist, marine biologist, and a historian on board to learn from. And then you'll go down to Antarctic, Antarctica, excuse me, and then back up to Ushuaia. And this itinerary we're excited about because it, we're adding it on for 2025. Um, it's um, it's a, a super special program. It goes to south of the Antarctic Circle. Um, it's not every voyage that gets down below this down below the Antarctic Circle. Um, really, the conditions have to be the ice conditions have to be a certain way to be able to make your way to the Antarctic Circle. So in December, November, December, even the beginning of January, sometimes the ice conditions are just too condensed, too packed to be able to make our way successfully south of the Antarctic Circle. So the perfect time to go is February, March. Um, and as well as, as well as it's coinciding with that whale bloom. So, or whale explosion, excuse me, that krill explosion. So um, really a cool up opportunity it's a little bit of a longer trip so it's I think the dates actually are a little bit incorrect but we can uh, correct that and, and send it out for you uh, it's a little bit of a longer trip um, I think about 15 days so we'll have to correct correct the um, dates and send those out to you later but um, so you you'll get a, um, a larger amount of time on the Antarctic Peninsula to explore that Antarctic this, those Antarctic vistas, the landscape can kind of really relax into the into the space and have more of an intimate um, expedition there. This is this these are the kinds of views that you'll be seeing south of the circle. So just like making your way through pack ice out on deck with your binoculars, looking for wildlife. Um, it's just a scene to behold, something super special. And there's the map for this one. So we'll disembark from Ushuaia, 
have a two day or one and a half to two day crossing on the Drake Passage, and then you'll be on the Antarctic Peninsula uh, for quite some time before heading back to Ushuaia. Oh, I put this slide in here because um, I wanted to say that I've just been talking about what is special about each trip at what time, but really the most special time or the right time to go is when you have the time. Um, you know, I, I got to go down there this year in February, January, February, and this was the moment for me that made the whole trip. So it was, we were out one day and we were on a Zodiac cruise and, um, it was this huge group. It, well, well, what was happening was these, this is, a, this is a bird called a Southern giant petrel. So it's a huge bird. It's hard to get the scale of it from this, from this image, but it's a huge bird. It's, um, a parasitic bird. So it's, it's feasting off of carcasses and, um, like stuff left around the landscape. And here all the, there was a penguin carcass that a leopard seal had left. And here all these giant petrels gathered together to kind of, they were eating this penguin carcass, but, um, I love the carnage. I can't help it. And so, and so they all were gathering together and they were barking these birds. Like it sounded like, like a dog bark and they were growling and barking and they just were feasting on this penguin carcass. It was, it was amazing. And our Zodiac driver just really seamlessly brought us in super close to this exceptional wildlife viewing opportunity. And it was, this was the moment that made the trip for me. It was probably about 30 seconds, but it was just amazing. And so I wanted to put this here because, um, like no matter when, what time of year you go, no matter when you go, just if you are keeping your eyes peeled, something amazing is going to happen. And I was in this, I was in this Zodiac observing these birds for 30 seconds and I was totally present in that moment. It was just amazing. And then after it happened, I could kind of take a breath and just be like, oh my goodness, what a moment. So it's just amazing. All these little tiny moments add up to all these wonderful experiences, but um, yeah, it really is the ultimate adult scavenger hunt. Uh, so as long as you have your binoculars and your eyes and you're out on deck, you are just going to, you're just going to be finding and observing the most amazing wildlife viewing opportunities ever. It's not hard to do in Antarctica because it's just this bio huge biodensity of wildlife. It's everywhere. It's just amazing. Um, sorry. Another, an another, um, <clears throat> another point I wanted to bring up is that it's such an opportunity to go on one of these ships. It's a huge privilege. <clears throat> and the beautiful thing that happens once you go on is the internet is not very good. And so it's a real opportunity to sort of, to well, not it's a real opportunity to disconnect from your life at home, from the details, from everything that's happening, from a busy mind, to just disconnect and have a digital detox and go on the ship and just be able to be present with the wildlife, to take it in, to really have those one-on-one -on -one opportunities with this wildlife. Um, and the opportunity for silence in a place like this is just really astounding. Um, silence and reflection is, is just key and you'll be in the most beautiful places. We always say that the person who you are before going to Antarctica is not the person who you'll be when you return. So it's, it's truly, um, if you give it a hundred percent, it's just a, a life-shaping, extraordinary experience. And you might not see 50 giant petrels eating a penguin, but what will you see? Oh, something amazing. This is a funny, this is a funny slide to talk about after that, but I guess we're getting into the nitty gritty details now. Um, but we wanted to talk a little bit about what to pack. And of course, we're not going into a huge long list here. Um, we just kind of wanted to cover some things that will really enhance your experience. And then should you choose to 
come on one of these expeditions with us, we can dive a little bit deeper into the packing list, but just on a, a little bit of a overview, the binoculars, probably the most important thing you can bring. Um, if you don't have a pair, borrow them from a friend. And if you don't have, and if you, they, your friend will let you borrow a pair, then it's, I would say just, just investing in a pair because it's the thing that is going to enhance your experience by 80, 90, a hundred percent. It just lets you zoom in on that wildlife, lets you really get up and in, interact with it in a, in a respectful way, not interact, but like that's your tool to be more interactive with the environment um, in a respectful way. Um, and then of course, face sunscreen. I apply when I'm there, I apply it like probably three times a day and as well as sunglasses. And uh, I would recommend um, having those polarized sunglasses as well. Comfortable shoes, closed toed, comfortable closed toed shoes for the ship as well. So um, you don't need very much, but just one pair of shoes to kind of get you around the ship um, and a buff. So just like that face and neck coverage, because when you're at, when you're out on a zodiac, it can be windy, can be snowy, and um, it's very sunny. So anything to protect you from those elements is just gold. Um, I never take mine off when I'm on the ship. I just wear it pretty much twenty four seven. I take it off to sleep, but um, yeah, it's just what it's your number one thing you need. Um, and then extra batteries for your, for your camera. So we're out there in the cold and the cold has a really draining effect on a camera battery. Um, so if you are there for, to take photos, please remember to bring an extra battery and uh, a universal adapter. So it's great to have them for your cabin. You can order them online now, or I know that they have, they sell them at MEC and REI. Um, you can just get a little cube and it's all in one. And then you can have it for the rest of your life if you don't already have one for anywhere else you go in the world. And um, the things that are provided on board that you don't have to bring are that Expedition Parka, Expedition Parka, excuse me, and that's for you to keep. There's an outer waterproof layer and an inner insulation insulated layer, and they're actually you're actually able to separate them, so you can wear um, the black inner layer without the outer layer. And um, we also provide muck boots while we're on the ship. Um, but you do have to give them back at the end. And um, that is all for me. And thank you so much for listening. I'm going to hand it over to Julia now to talk a little bit about this slide. Thanks, Franny. Um, so we just wanted to quickly cover um, what we have currently on offer. So our 2023 and 2024 spring departures um, are still 25% off. So there are limited space available. So we want to make sure that you do get a spot if you are interested in going. Um, and we have launched our 2024-2025 season, so we currently have an early booking bonus on those. So um, like we were talking about before, the Falkland Islands in South Georgia are now 30% off with the early booking bonus and this crossing the circle with the right date of February 4th to 17th, 2025 is 20% off with the early, um, early booking bonus plus a $250 USD uh, per person onboard ship credit. So if you are interested, you have to book now um, and you can talk to Julianne, who's our polar expert as well. And if you have questions, you can talk to Franny. Um, you can reach us at adventures at Wild Woman Expeditions or call us or connect with us on social. So with that, we're gonna open the field to questions. If anyone has any questions, you can feel free to enter them into your chat box now and we can help uh, answer some questions. Don't see any questions at this time, um, but I do know one that women do often ask are about hiking poles. Will there be the option to, um, should they bring their own or should they, or is there gonna be an option to borrow them? Great question. We absolutely supply walking and hiking poles on every excursion. So they will be provided. 
And really this is, again, I can't stress enough, even if people are thinking expedition for Antarctica, it's at the bottom of the world, it really is for so many different types of travelers. Again, I brought up my aunt and I, I did at the beginning to share a story because it was just one of the most special moments of my life with her. And she's a photographer, an avid photographer. She loves walking and contemplative walks, but I love the charging groups and walking and hiking a bit faster paced. So one morning we jumped in a Zodiac together and we were supposed to go on a landing site. But in true expedition fashion, we were in a, 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 a harbor, a, bay, a little bay, and a mother a humpback whale and her calf appeared. So that morning we actually didn't go on the landing because we were in similar to what Franny was experiencing with that incredible petrol moment that only lasted about 30 seconds. We really expect the unexpected in these areas. But later on that afternoon, my aunt and I, my aunt wanted to stay on board, go through her photos that she had seen, have a cup of tea, see the scenery and the wildlife from the comfort of the ship. And then I went out with a group of hikers and met some other wonderful travelers, like-minded individuals. And then my aunt and I could have dinner with a few other folks when we when I got back. So even though you're in a group situation traveling on the little vessel, people can have each their own intimate moments of doing what they want and then coming back to the Wild Women Expedition group as well. Great, thank you, Kara. So we have a couple of questions coming through. Um, on the Crossing the Circle expedition, how many different land stops happen on the Antarctic Peninsula? Um, and can you comment about the fitness level for the different off-ship adventures? Can you repeat that question, Julia? Yes. So for Crossing the Circle, um, how many different land stops happen on the Antarctic Peninsula? I guess how many excursions go out and how, how many they can expect um, and the fitness level for the different off ship adventures. So I'm assuming the hiking and the paddling and the kayaking. That's a great question. Um, so the answer, was that specifically about the crossing the circle or the Antarctic Peninsula? Crossing the circle. The crossing the circle. Okay. Um, well, as Kara mentioned, we always try to disembark the disembark the vessel twice a day. So we'll try to have an excursion in the morning and there'll be, and then we'll have an, come back for lunch and then we'll go it again in the afternoon. Saying that, that's all weather dependent. So if, if the wind is blowing a hundred knots, we're not going to be leaving the ship. And instead we'll choose to observe the weather, the force of the weather and the, the views from the ship as well as we might mirror uh, some educational programming on board as well into that time. There's, and then the, and then um, how to, on every expedition, there'll be a set number of crossing days. So on the circle trip, it's about 15 days from the 4th to the 17th. Um, I might be off a day or two there, but it's two day cross. It's one day uh, embarkation day, and then it's a two day crossing. It's a two day crossing on the way back as well. So the time in the middle there is the time for the um, when we'll be at the continent, and those days are the landing days. So I think on the crossing the circle, there's about seven, maybe eight days where there's landings, um, and then again. Uh, as Kara mentioned, we really try to take people out twice a day. Um, and, you know, because it's an expedition, let's say, for example, the weather is really crummy in the morning. Um, there might be an op like an opportunity, depending on what's happening, to go on a Zodiac cruise after dinner. I've, I've been a part of that before. Um, or there might be like a pre-breakfast landing in Zodiac cruise some, sometimes. It just totally depends what the weather is doing. Um, and what the itinerary looks like on the on the vessel that you're on. Um, no two itineraries, no two ex expeditions are ever the same. So um, whenever you're out there, it's going to be something different. But that's what makes it so special. 
Great, thank you, Franny. We have, uh, it's eight o'clock now, so we're cognizant of time. I just wanna ask one more question that we have and then any other questions we'll get through via email in the response. But for everyone, seasickness, assuming the waters can be rough, do you have any tips for those who suffer from motion sickness? Um, if you suffer from motion sickness, I would suggest um, talking to your doctor before you come and they'll be able to give you any kind of medication that you might need. And then when you're on the ship, what what's available for you is there's a, a cork expedition doctor. So there's an ER doctor on every every voyage uh, and they will be able to help you if you're experiencing some sort of sickness. So they might have some extra meds or they might have more powerful meds uh, to help you if you're really incapacitated. Um, and then some other things that you can do are have ginger, um, make sure that you're getting fresh air out on deck, weather permitting, of course. Um, and, um, yeah. I really found, sorry, Franny, to interrupt. I really found that nipping it in the bud was the best way. And I was really fortunate, but each time I've been on, um, a polar trip, I, would feel it for, you know, maybe the first or second morning. Um, and I didn't want to eat breakfast and I just kind of felt a little bit woozy and I would just go lie down and just try to rest. And, and that helped both times. And so I think if you try to fight it, um, it doesn't always work and it doesn't work out in your favor, but, um, keeping food in your stomach also not having an empty stomach seemed to really help, which seems, doesn't, it seems a little counterintuitive, but, uh, yeah. I tried to stray away from medication, but that is definitely an option. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we're out of time for the day, so, uh, so we will end the webinar here. But I want to thank the panelists. Thank you, Kara from Cork. Thank you, Franny. Thank you, Julianne, for attending. And thank you to all of the attendees who have attended the webinar. We hope this was informative, and we will answer all the questions that we didn't get to. Um, and for those who watch the recording after, thank you for watching. Have a great evening, everyone.